Hi, I'm Brian Moy with Apigee. We work closely with many people on web APIs. Some are experts running the world's most profitable APIs. Others are just getting started. In this four-part series, we'll apply universal principles of design to APIs. When an API is created with quality, the application developers who use the API often elevate their craftsmanship when making apps. The goal of this series is to put the API team in a position to create a virtuous cycle of constantly improving API and application development. The principles we will consider are drawn from the book Universal Principles of Design. It covers 100 design ideas drawn from fields as diverse as advertising, psychology, automotive design, and architecture. Of the 100 principles in the book, we'll take 13 and apply them end-to-end -to, -end to an API initiative. We'll cover the design ideas in four parts. Our approach is simple. We'll introduce a design principle, provide examples of the principle in action, and based on what we see, we'll create a checklist of best practices. Let's get started with our first session. Part 1, Empathize. Our goal in this session is to put the API team in the shoes of their application developers. Let's understand how developers build apps. Developers work in a development cycle sometimes formally, more often informally, with four phases, requirements gathering, design, development, and testing. At each stage, the API team needs to ask two key questions. Number one, what is the developer doing at this stage? And number two, how can we help? Let's take a look at each phase. The first thing our application developer does when creating an app is gather requirements. Developers are smart and clever, but they don't know the details of every solution domain, including ours. So what can we do to help our application developer during the requirements phase? We can help by sharing our domain knowledge. Let's look at some examples. Etsy is a service for people to buy and sell handmade or vintage items. On their About page, Etsy provides an overview of who they are and what they do. For those who are not familiar with the craft movement or online commerce, Etsy's videos and supporting text make it easy to understand their business domain. The content wasn't necessarily designed for developers, but it provides helpful context for developers in the requirements gathering phase. SoundCloud is an online audio distribution platform that allows musicians to collaborate, promote, and distribute their music. They provide a fantastic tour of their platform for end users. Like Etsy, the tour wasn't designed specifically for developers, but it will help them as they research their customer requirements for their apps. Unlike Etsy and SoundCloud, Twilio does not have typical end users. They are essentially a pure API company for telephony services in the cloud. They do a nice job of providing content about their business domain and how cloud telephony works. They built that content just for developers who use their API. Google AdWords is one of Google's key revenue generating businesses. They have many partners like ad placement agencies who build apps on their API. Google provides training courses about advertising in general and their service in particular. Google also offers a four-pay certifi certification program to verify partners understand the advertising domain. One can imagine with such resources available, app devs will be savvy when it comes to gathering application requirements. When it comes to helping developers gather requirements, we just saw some great examples. From Etsy and SoundCloud, we learned that if our company already has content about our business domain, we don't need to create recreate it. Instead, we can link to it from our developer website. From Twilio, we learn that if our product is the API, or we don't have those existing materials, then we'll want to create something compelling just for our developers. The lesson from Google, especially for API teams focused on partners, is to formalize our domain knowledge transfer through a learning center and consider certifying our app developers through a partner program. Let's move on to the design phase. During the design phase, the developer is translating abstract requirements into a tangible form. At this point, he will be looking for inspiration, guidance, and an understanding of what is possible. How can we help? We can point the way, share what other developers have done, provide guidance on how we would like to see apps design, and importantly, provide a high-level view of the key objects in our API. As developers start translating their requirements into an app, they'll be facing a blank piece of paper. We can inspire them by showcasing cool apps already built on our API. Foursquare, the location-based social networking company, provides a gallery of apps to help developers better understand their domain, use cases, and inspire them to think about what is possible. After the initial inspiration, developers will start iterating and shaping their app. They'll start to have questions about how to use our data, our brand, and our logo. Twitter provides display guidelines for their application developers so that they create better apps, and Twitter gets to maintain some influence over their brand and assets. As the design gets more and more detailed, developers will want to better understand the objects in our API. WordNick provides a list of their API objects with just the right amount of detail for the design phase. 
It's often tempting to provide every detail of every method of every object in our API docs, but that misses the point of our current discussion. Empathize with what the developer is trying to do at each stage of the development cycle. The secret to Wordnik's approach is to provide a clear, full-page listing of the objects in the system with just one level of detail about the methods available for each object. That makes it easy to scan and see the big picture with just enough detail to make an informed design decision. From Foursquare, we learned to inspire our developers with a gallery of exemplary apps built on our API. From Twitter, we learned to publish design guidelines both to aid the developers and maintain influence over our brand assets. And from Wordnik, we learned to give developers a simple one-page listing of objects in our API, which way that they will find useful during the design phase. The more inspiration, guidance, and information we can give to developers at the design phase, the better the applications they'll build. Let's move on to the development phase. During the development phase, the developer starts to build the app. At this point, he will be using our API. So how can we help? We help by sharing knowledge of our APIs, allow developers to easily explore our API and collaborate with other developers, and contact our API team for help. Our API is only one of many components our developers will need to learn and use to build his app. Our goal is to be respectful of his time and make our component of the app as easy to learn and use as possible. LinkedIn, for example, provides an API console powered by Apigee that allows developers to learn their API by using it on real app data without writing any code. Many developers are social animals. As they develop apps, they often collaborate with other developers to help them write code and fix bugs. LinkedIn makes it very easy for the developers to take a snapshot of any API request and response so that it can be shared with other developers for collaboration. Developers can accomplish a lot on their own and working with their peers, but they will also benefit from, have, from having direct access to our API team. The Twitter API team provides at least three levels of contact for developers. A support forum hosted by Google Groups, a highly responsive Twitter API account on Twitter, and via an email account. Sharing our API knowledge should include a standard website filled with documentation and code examples. We also learn from LinkedIn to provide developers an API console so that they can easily learn the API, start writing code, and easily share information about the API. And from Twitter, we learn to be accessible for multiple channels, including support forums, social networks, and email. The more help we provide the developer during the development phase, the sooner the app will get to market and the fewer bugs the app will have to fix. Let's move on to the final testing phase. There are three aspects here. Getting customer feedback and acceptance, overall quality and integration, and real-world performance. How can we help here? We can provide the developers with lots of data, and we can make ourselves available to hear feature requests from our developers. Let's look at some examples. During customer testing, the developer will get feedback on features and capabilities of his app, including missing functionality. The API team can help during this phase of testing by having their issue tracker online so that developers can create new feature requests and even log bug reports. Twitter does this well both for enhancement and bugs so that developers can get their requests into the API backlog and improve their apps. During overall integration and quality testing of the app, the developer will, will want to understand how all the app components work together. The API T can help during this phase of testing by providing data on API requests and errors, both over time and by specific API requests. Real-world performance testing of the app is next. When an app suffers from poor performance, the developer has to go through a process of elimination in order to remove bottlenecks. The API team can help during this phase of testing by providing data of API performance, both over time and again by request, so that the developer can more quickly rule out the API as a performance problem, or if the API is a problem, quickly isolate and fix it. During the testing phase, we learned from Twitter to provide an issue tracker so developers can request new features and report bugs, and we saw how providing data about errors, API requests, and performance will improve the overall quality and performance of apps. Understanding the development cycle is the biggest step the API team will make toward empathizing with the application developer. After walking through each phase of the development cycle, we ended up with nine items for the API team to implement. The first principle, the one we just covered, was a big one. Let's move on to the next two design principles. They'll move pretty quickly. Developers have a unique relationship with errors. Unlike physical systems where errors are often costly and time consuming, an error made during application development is essentially free and fast. So developers often rely on error codes and error reporting to actually learn how a system works. This is especially true of developing apps based on APIs. The API team can help developers by understanding, first of all, that a developer is more likely to try something first and read the manual second. By making it easy to learn the API through errors, will help the developer learn in a mode he is most comfortable. There are two key components to a web API error, the response body and the HTTP status code. 
The best API designs understand that the response body is for the developer to read and understand at development time, whereas the HTTP status code is for the runtime application to parse and react in runtime. Let's take a look. The HTTP status code for an error should follow the standards outlined by the W3C. They can be found on the W3C website, Wikipedia, and many other sources. The response message for an error is for the developer to read. A common mistake made by the API team is to make the error message terse and network efficient. That's a mistake. Instead, the error message should be as verbose as needed to help the developer understand what is happening and even provide hits, hints about how to resolve issues. Twilio has an elegant approach to errors. Along with the HTTP status code, they also return a custom Twilio error code in the response message. Importantly, Twilio provides a link to their documentation with a verbose message and details about the error and how to resolve it. We highly recommend following Twilio's approach, and we also suggest including a commentary section on each of those error pages so that developers can help one another resolve issues. Keep in mind, developers have a unique relationship to errors. Remember the response body is for the developer at development time, and the HTTP status code is for the app logic at runtime. Follow the W3C standards for the status codes, and be verbose as possible for the response message. We highly recommend following Twilio's lead, provide error pages with plenty of details and social features to help developers help themselves resolve issue issues more quickly. Our third and final design principle for this session is visibility. Once a developer's app is launched and deployed, he is depending on our API to stay up and running and error free. We also need to keep in mind that the future of the developer's app is tied into the future of our API. So how can we help? An API can be a complex system. It's very likely we'll make mistakes along the way. System failures or human errors or both. We can improve our overall API program by providing visibility into how our API is running and being honest, transparent, and humble when mistakes occur. We can also give developers an indication of where we plan to take our API in the future. Here's some examples. 65% of Salesforce.com's traffic is API traffic. They provide a website called Trust that includes system level announcements and an up-to-date status panel of their servers around the world. If a developer gets an alert that his application is having problems, he can quickly validate the source of the problem. If it's not the Salesforce API, he can move on to the next potential source of the problem. Otherwise, he can quickly isolate the problem and get it resolved. GitHub, a source code repository, like many other websites, uses a blog and Twitter to announce outages. Importantly, they provide details about the cause of issues and outages that have happened in the past. Their tone is frank, transparent, and delivered with humility. As a result, their developer community is very supportive and encouraging. Understanding that once an API is included in an app, the two have a shared fate. Facebook publishes their API roadmap on their developer website. By being transparent about the future of the API, Facebook developers can make better decisions today that will impact the future of their apps. When it comes to a complex system, like an app relying on an API, visibility is a virtue. We've learned from Salesforce.com to publish the real-time status of our API servers, including system announcements. From GitHub, we've seen that detailed explanation of outages mixed with a dose of humility are appreciated by app developers and create trust between application developers and the API team. And we saw how Facebook publishes their roadmap so that developers better understand and anticipate the changes they'll need to make to their apps for the future. That wraps, wraps up our first and longest session on design principles. By empathizing with our developers, we created a checklist of 15 tangible actions we can take to better align our API team with the needs of our application developers. Educate them about our, about our domain, certify our partner developers, inspire folks with an app gallery, guide the design of apps with a, a guidelines document, list the objects in our system in a simple way, engage developers with an API console that they can share, be accessible via forum, social media, and email, receive bugs and feature requests directly from developers, so each developer has API data, respond with HTTP status codes for apps, and respond with verbose messages for app developers, create social error pages with details and hints, broadcast system status and alerts, apologize for mistakes and give details, and finally, publish the API product roadmap. In the next session, we'll cover part two, Don't Overwhelm, where we'll tackle four more design principles. Stay tuned. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Brian Malloy. You can reach me on Twitter at landlessness or directly on email. I'm brian at apogee.com. Thanks again.